Good evening and welcome. I'm Caroline Brick, Executive Director of Tikva's Jewish Parents Forum, and it's a privilege to be here tonight. The last time I addressed an audience from this bima was for my own bat mitzvah, and I have to say it's great to be back. <laughs> I think it's fitting that we're gathered together, not in a lecture hall or an auditorium, but in a sanctuary. The word sanctuary derives from two Latin words, sanctus, which means holy, and arium, which means container. Throughout our history, we as Jews have built and gathered in sanctuaries, sacred spaces insulated from the profane to engage in communal rituals that elevate us in our relationships with God and connect us more deeply with one another. As Jews, we make it a priority to strengthen and preserve our spiritual and social well-being. We are convening this evening because we notice forces affecting the mental and spiritual health of our children. We see how smartphones, and social media in particular, are contributing to a mental health crisis among young people. Countless parents in this community, parents who are here tonight, are wrestling with this in their homes and have reached out to express concern. But it's not just us. The Surgeon General of the United States has sounded the alarm. 41 states are currently suing Meta for its exploitation of young people for profit. At a time when our country is as polarized as it's ever been, these allegations and this sentiment mark rare bipartisan agreement among government leaders and parents across America. But for our community, October 7th has brought a renewed sense of urgency to this issue. Over the past many weeks, Hamas has weaponized social media, using it as a tool to broadcast their atrocities and inflict further psychological harm on our community. Several school leaders, many who are here tonight, at the urging of the Israeli government, even counseled parents to disable Instagram from their children's phones. We also recognize that something eerie is happening on TikTok. Anti-Semitic and anti-American propaganda is sweeping up young Americans in support of Hamas. Just a couple weeks ago, major TikTok influencers racked up millions of views on videos openly praising the murderous mastermind behind 9-11, Osama bin Laden. How did we get here? And what does an appropriate response look like? As a Jewish community, we invest heavily in our physical security. But what are we doing as a community to protect our children in the virtual world? Are we investing in the right kind of cybersecurity for the human soul? These are some of the questions we're going to explore with Dr. Jonathan Haidt, who wants me to tell you that he has a cyst on his vocal cords, so he'll be a little quiet, but we'll listen well. Um, who will share findings from his own research at NYU. Dr. Haidt will also suggest practical solutions that both parents and school leaders can implement, recognizing that homes and schools are formative and that together they form a vital partnership. I look forward to exploring these issues together this evening. I would now like to invite to the podium Julie Blimbaum Markovici, a leader of our host committee, a member of the Jewish Parents Forum, um, to speak about JPF and to introduce Jonathan Haidt. Julie. Caroline, I am blown away by you and everything that you do. Um, yeah, I think she gets another round of applause. You are amazing. I'm Julie Blinbaum, Markovici, depends how you know me. I'm a Ramaz alum, a working mom, a parent of two, a Ramaz student, Sabine, who is six, and Noah, who is three. Um, and I look around this room tonight, and I'm amazed. I know I'm seeing only a small fraction of the people who are joining us tonight from over 50 Jewish day schools, not just across the tri-state area, but around the country. Um, tonight, we also have a virtual army of 3,000 people on Zoom, so hello to everybody who's tuning in tonight. What most of you don't know is that 
What we're seeing tonight sprung out of a Jewish Parents Forum event we did last March with Dr. Leonard Sachs. In 2021, Caroline launched the Jewish Parents Forum. Uh, it meant to strengthen parents interested in raising morally courageous Jews, proud Zionists, and patriotic Americans. JPF is a project of Tikva, an important think tank and educational institution whose purpose is to confront the most serious challenges facing the Jewish people, Israel, and America through education and ideas. She hates when I say this, but Caroline has built a cult-like following around the country, centered around these in-person discussions with leading thinkers exploring the major challenges facing Jewish parents in America. So going back to March of last year, we had all seen the headlines about social media, but seeing the facts and the figures and the trends laid out by Dr. Leonard Sachs, we, it became clear that as parents in the Jewish day school community, we didn't just have a unique opportunity, but an obligation to protect our kids. And what he laid out was a collective action problem by definition. But as my dad always says, the impossible we do immediately, the inconceivable takes just a little bit longer. And what started out as a conversation over coffee after that event, CERN tuned in, turned into JPF focus groups around the tri-state area with parents. Uh, a brain trust was built of passionate parents committed to partnering with their communities to embrace common sense practices that help our children thrive. That's why we are so thrilled to have Dr. Jonathan Haidt here with us tonight. He is the leading expert on the teen mental health crisis and how much social media has really contributed to it. And we thought it was important not just to have you address our group, but to really bring this conversation to the entire community. I first heard Jonathan Haidt on a uh, Barry Weiss podcast a couple years ago. It was so great, I actually listened to it twice. Uh, he is a social psychologist at NYU School Stern of Business. Uh, he received his PhD from my alma mater, the University of Pennsylvania. His research uh, has examined the intuitive foundations of morality and how morality varies across cultural and political divisions. Um, but since 2008, he's really been studying the contributions of social media to the decline in teen mental health and the rise of political dysfunction in America. He is the author of multiple New York Times best-selling books, including The Coddling of the American Mind, and his, uh, he's almost finished with his next book. I have to tell you, I'm a little jealous. Caroline got an advanced copy. I did not. I'm still waiting, of uh, The Anxious Generation. Dr. Haidt, it's an honor and a privilege to have you here with us. Uh, so we're here tonight uh, to talk about children. Um, children, education, and the epidemic of mental illness that began around 2013. Um, and this evening, uh, as, as Julie said, was planned, uh, was planned long ago. The topic was picked. But we're here tonight, 60 days after the savage attack uh, by Hamas on Israel. We're here tonight, 59 days after university presidents finally discovered a topic they had no opinion about. And we're here 58 days after we all discovered that there was a lot of support for Hamas, not just for the Palestinians, but for Hamas on university campuses. Now, how did this happen? <clears throat> um, when I was young, my mother told me that America is the promised land for the Jews. And survey data backs her up. Pew Research surveys Americans, <clears throat> and when they ask them, how do you feel about Protestants, Catholics, Muslims, Buddhists. The highest rated religious group in America is the Jews. America is a philo-Semitic country, not anti-Semitic. <clears throat> Americans um, like Jews. <clears throat> um, furthermore, in the current war, when you look at which side Americans are on, they are firmly on the side of Israel, unless they were born in 1996 or later. For Gen Z, born 1996 and later, uh, at least one survey showed an even division. Now, many don't have a strong opinion, but of those that do, it was about uh, roughly maybe like a third sided with Israel. A third, you know, the question was, which side do you support, Israel or Hamas? And about a third picked Hamas. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Uh, so even if I am right that America is philo-Semitic, it won't be for much longer unless we do something. So once again, how did this happen? 
Now, answering that question is, is not my central goal tonight. I'm going to focus on, on what's happening to children. Um, but this question is on all of our minds. Especially, I don't know how many of you saw the, the testimony by the presidents of universities yesterday in Congress. Yeah, I mean, my God. And, you know, like Julie, I, I got my PhD from Penn. And to see Penn, you know, one of the worst schools in America, according to FIRE, for, for its speech climate, to see the president unable to say whether a student calling for genocide against the Jews, is that a violation of your speech code? And she said, well, if it, if it becomes behavior, then yes. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, this is on all of our minds, and I'm going to focus on kids, but as you'll see, if you understand what happened to Gen Z, why are they so different? Why is their mental health so bad? then you can begin to understand why it was so easy to manipulate them on social media and why they have a big empty hole in their lives that they will fill with political causes of the moment. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you what I've learned from writing my new book, The Anxious Generation, and then in conversation um, with Caroline, we'll work out specifically how Jewish day schools can, can draw on these ideas and can really turn around this epidemic because you're very well situated. I'll explain why you have certain advantages that secular schools do not have. <clears throat> All right, so what happened? Um, if we look at rates of teen mental illness in America, they were quite low in the middle of the last century uh, when data began to be collected. So uh, the silent generation after the greatest generation had very good mental health, uh, very low rates of depression and anxiety. Um, then the baby boomers come along, their rates are, are higher of depression, anxiety, mental illness. Uh, Gen X, a little higher still. Uh, and they were the peak crazy generation. Um, uh, the millennials actually, their mental health, you know, the mental illness actually goes down a bit. So in the, two, in the late 90s and in the 2000s, teen mental health was actually getting a little bit better. And then we hit 2013 and everything goes to hell. It's as though a bomb went off and instantly teen mental health plummeted, especially for girls. Um, so if you look at the first slide, you'll see on the upper left, it says slide one. Um, you can see this is data collected by universities. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that the reason that students are coming in to the mental health center suddenly uh, reporting rates of anxiety and depression way beyond what was ever seen. And that all begins. Uh, what I've done is I've shaded on these graphs, I've shaded 2010 to 2015. That's what I call the great rewiring. That's when childhood changed radically. And you can see the lines bend up during that five-year period. Um, the, uh, especially depression and anxiety is gendered. So you can see that you get much more of a hockey stick for girls in slide two. Now, relatively speaking, boys and girls are both up about 150%. So boys are doing worse too, but their rates are much lower. Girls' rates are so high, and the rates for anxiety are even higher than depression. So we're talking somewhere in the 30s or 40s, somewhere around 40% uh, or maybe more of American girls uh, suffer from clinically diagnosable anxiety or depression. Being anxious and depressed is a normal part of being an American girl now. It wasn't like that before 2012. <clears throat> Some people have said, oh, come on. This is just self-report data. It's good that they're willing to talk about it. This is a sign of progress. No, because we see the exact same curves when we look at behavior. If you look in uh, slide three, you see the suicide rate, and it does the same thing as the other ones. It goes way up, and the sh the, the, you can see, especially for girls, um, it's, you know, right in 2012, there was no sign of a problem. 2013, 50% increase for, for the younger girls. Um, uh, and we see the same thing for self-harm, for hospital hospitalizations, emergency room visits. It's, it's not on the chart, but we see the same thing. And guess what? We see the same thing in Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. Um, Zach Rausch and I, my, my, research, my res lead researcher, um, uh, he also found that it's happening in Scandinavia. And just yesterday, he found it's happening actually all across Europe. So something changed in childhood all across the developed world, and young people, especially young women, suddenly got very much, much more depressed and anxious. 
Now, why do you suppose this happened? When I speak on this, people always say, oh no, it's, you know, they, they have their own pet theories. It's because of school shootings. Of course they're anxious. You know, or it's because of Donald Trump, or it's because of, of um, no child left behind, school pressure. Okay, but why did Donald Trump and school shootings make girls in New Zealand and Australia suddenly check into an emergency room? There's only one theory I have found that can explain why the same thing happened in the same way, at the same time, in so many countries. And it happens to be my theory, the theory that I made up, which is, uh, you see in slide four, um, that I believe what happened um, is that um, childhood used to be play-based from about 50 million BC to 2010. M young mammals play. You have to play to wire up your brain. Um, and, but that ended in 2010. It, it began to drop around 1980, but it really ends in 2010, because uh, that's when the phone-based childhood comes in. And that, I believe, is what, is, called, is what is causing the international collapse of teen mental health. <clears throat> um, so, uh, let's see. Um, okay, so Gen Z uh, is different from the millennials because they are the result of a giant experiment performed on children with no safety testing, no control condition, no information given to parents. It's as if we sent our kids to Mars to grow up, and then we find that their development was altered. <clears throat> I can show you how radically childhood changed with this simple demonstration here in this group. And if you're watching on Zoom, please try this at home. What I want to ask you all is the age at which you were let out. What, at what age could you go out the door, go over to a friend's house a few blocks away, you and your friend, maybe you ride bicycles, you go to an ice cream store, when did you get independence? So if that was you in first grade, if you could go out with friends in first grade, you would say six, age six. If that was third grade, you'd say eight. If it was fifth grade, you'd say 10. If it wasn't until um, seventh grade, you'd say 12. Uh, and then uh, what, ninth grade would be 14. Okay, so everyone think of what your number is. Don't say anything. Everyone, you have your number? Like roughly when you were let out? So we're gonna answer by generation. Um, so first, raise your hand <clears throat> if you were born uh, in 1980 or earlier. Raise your hand high. Okay, so just you, you guys are all um, Gen X and, you can put your hands down, you're all Gen X or baby boomers. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and there may be a couple of uh, people also from the silent generation. So just you, I'm gonna sweep my finger around the room and when I point to you, just yell out your number, okay? And just, everybody just listen, okay? Just yell it out. Wait, let's wait, start again, wait. So everyone, you have to be quiet to hear it. And we're, it's, only the, it's only those before, before 1980 who are gonna speak, okay? So let's try it again, yell it out nice and loud. Okay, so this is what I find everywhere. It's mostly six and eight. Um, uh, and you, we had a couple of 10s and 11s, but most of you said six, seven, or eight. That's what I always find. That was the norm. Because if you were not let out to play with your friends in fourth grade, like, what are, you, what are your parents doing to you? Somebody should call the police. Whereas today, if you let your kids out in fourth grade, what are those parents doing? Someone should call the police. Well, let's test that. We may not have a lot of Gen Z here. Uh, raise your hand if you were born in, 19, we'll even do 1995, 1995 or later, raise your hand high. Okay, we just have about seven or eight. Let's try it, let's try it with you. Okay, so you just yell, yell out your age really loud. Go ahead. Okay, so it's, it's mostly two-digit numbers and a couple of nines. So some kids get independence in fourth grade, but mostly it's middle school. We don't let kids out till middle school. <clears throat> now, those of you who have, who have children, um, born, who have Gen Z children, let me ask you, at what age did you or will you, before you heard this talk, at what age did you or will you let your kids out? So raise your hand if you have Gen Z kids. Raise your hand. Okay, so now the Gen Z parents, 
what was your kid's age of liberation? Yell it out. Right. Okay, so it was all double-digit numbers, and you are raising your kids in a New York City that is so vastly much safer than it was when the rest of us grew up. In the 70s and 80s, there was a huge crime wave, but kids played outside, muggers didn't seem to bother kids. Uh, and now, you know, I mean, okay, in the last year or two, but, but in the, you know, five years ago, uh, it, was re it was really safe in New York. Um, <clears throat> so we have come to implement what you might call a, 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 uh, um, a cycle of incompetence. Um, I have, in the book, I have a, a photograph of a playground in Berkeley, California, where they put up, it's an elementary school, and they have signs with all these rules for how to play tag. <laughs> and I've got some of them here. It was rule number one, include everyone. Rule number two, resolve disagreements with rock, paper, scissors because we do not want you negotiating. We do not want you to understand nuance or complexity. Just make it random. Uh, rule number three, one finger touch. Because kids are so fragile that if you tag someone, they might break. Um, in the rules for playing touch football, it says, football can only be played if an adult is supervising and refereeing the game. Touch football. Once again, we're trying to make sure that our kids never learn to be self-supervising or self-governing, otherwise they might be prepared to be democratic citizens. And, right, American citizens. Um, so, <clears throat> um, uh, so we act as though they are fragile and the world is dangerous when neither one is true. Um, we raised our kids with an insane fear of abduction, where abduction in this country almost never, ever happens by strangers. It's almost always the non-custodial parent. There is no white vans abducting kids. Okay, there was one, it's true, there was one this year. But we're a very large country, it happens less than 100 times a year in this country. Um, <clears throat> so we've pulled our kids out of communities, out of the real world, we think it's too dangerous for them. And instead, we're letting them grow up in networks. But you can't grow up in a network. Humans have to be rooted in communities. Now, the internet, it turns out, came in two waves. And I didn't understand this until I found this figure. So if you look at slide five, you see the adoption curves for some technologies. And you, know, you can see like there's a period where everybody is getting a color TV. And there's a period where everyone is getting a personal computer. And so personal computer and dial-up um, internet access, those were paired. Um, those, that was two technologies, they came in together um, beginning in the 80s and by the late 90s and early 2000s ev almost everybody had a computer at home and they had access to the internet and it was amazing, right? Those of you old enough to remember, the internet was incredible and we thought, wow, this is going to be so good for our kids, they have access to all the information, it's going to be so good for democracy, you know, how can, you know, good luck China keeping people off the internet, you'll never be able to do that. Um, so we, we thought it was going to be amazing, and it was. Mental health, as I said, actually got better, and democracies kept rising. It wasn't just the fall of the Iron Curtain. By 2012, the world had more democracies than it ever had in history. And then the second wave comes in, and that is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one of them is not labeled. Um, it's um, smart, uh, social media is the yellow, and then the red one is, um, uh, is smartphones. Those are a paired technology. Uh, social media, there were some sort of things like that in the 90s, but it's really 2003, 2004, when you get Friendster and, and Facebook and, and a whole bunch. Um, but it's only once young people have a smartphone in their pocket, they have the internet in their pocket, before then, you had to sit down at your parents' computer and dial up to get on Facebook. But by 2010, young people are trading in their flip phones for smartphones with high-speed data plans. Now they have access to Facebook and well, Instagram and other things whenever they want. If they're in an elevator ride, 25 seconds, pull it out, go on Instagram. They do this all day long. What effect does this have? Um, so, okay, 
Um, <clears throat> all right, so what effect did it have? Um, <clears throat> so there are many, many harms to children. We in the research community have focused overwhelmingly on anxiety and depression because that's what we can measure. We have good data on that. And I've been in, engaged in debate with other researchers who say, oh, the effects are tiny, it can't explain it. And we're all arguing over this one causal link. But actually, there's like 15 or 20 different threats and causes that are causing 15 or 20 different bad outcomes. And we're all fighting over this one link. And in the book, I'm trying to rip off the curtain and say, this is insane. This is decimating our kids in 15 different ways. So let me show you some of those. Um, slide six is what I call the five foundational harms. These are harms to all kids who have a phone-based childhood. If your kid has a phone and, in, and constant internet access, and if they can be on it whenever they want or almost whenever they want, then they have a phone-based childhood. And these are the costs that hit most kids. Your kids might not suffer from some of them, but these are the most widespread ones. So the first is just the opportunity cost. The, you, you hear a number, the numbers that are found are something like seven hours a day on average of screen-based leisure time for preteens. Seven hours a day for preteens. Nine hours a day for high school kids. Now imagine if you got nine hours a day extra of email and you had to spend nine hours every day doing extra email. There's nothing left in your life. It pushes everything out. What does it push out? Um, well, the most important one, I believe, is other people. Um, you have no time for other people in person because you have to spend all day long servicing your network, all day long. Um, this little graph on the right there shows the average daily time spent with friends, a time use study of Americans. And what you can see is that young people, of course, spend a lot more time with their friends than middle-aged people who are married and have a job. But look what happens beginning in the great rewiring. The number begins to plummet. And yes, 2020, at the end of the graph, is COVID. But 2019 is just halfway up that last bit. In other words, COVID did not have a noticeable impact. Their time with friends was plummeting so fast in 20, by 2019 that COVID just continued the same curve they were on, which is stunning that our children had already socially distanced themselves by 2019. Uh, and this, of course, is because relationships are the most important aspect of mental health. So if kids aren't spending a lot of time with friends, of course their mental health is gonna suffer. Sleep deprivation is more obvious. Um, attention fragmentation is incredibly important in this educational context. I teach, I teach courses at Stern, um, grad students and, MBA, uh, and undergrads. And for all of the, the MBAs are mostly, well now they're actually Gen Z and millennial, but the undergrads of course are all Gen Z. And I'm stunned to discover, uh, I work with them on improving their morning routine and their evening routine. It's a course called Flourishing. And, and I have them list out exactly what they do from the moment they open their eyes to the you know, time they go off to school and, and at the end of the day uh, when they start their bed routine. And guess what the very last thing they do before they close their eyes is? It's checking their media feeds, it's checking their texts, their DMs, their Instagram posts. For most of them, it's the very last thing, in bed with their phone, okay? Then they sleep seven hours on average, um, and then they open their eyes, and what do you think the first thing they do is? The same thing. And in between, what do you think they do? The same thing. Now, they go to classes, but in a school that does not ban phones, they're on their phones all day during class, because if some kids are texting, you have to be in the know. You can't be the only one who doesn't know about the scandal, the gossip, the drama that happened at third period. So, uh, so young people, uh, here I'm talking more especially about like high school kids, but I see it in my undergrads as well. Um, their attention is fragmented like crazy. Many of them, most of them, get, a, get an alert, a vibration, Every time they get an email, they don't know to shut off notifications because notifications are just normal life. You should always be interrupted by your phone. You should never have 30 seconds free to think. 
Um, and then the final one is behavioral addiction, uh, because these things are designed to be addictive. In fact, you know that, that feature where you, you pull down to refresh, like you pull down and it just kind of bounces up and you get your new messages? That was literally copied from slot machines. They wanted a slot machine type motion for that. So that's happening to all kids, boys and girls. But if you turn the page, um, now there's a whole chapter. So that was chapter five of the book. Uh, in chapter six, um, I go through what's happening to girls. And here, I won't go through them all because there's just so much going on. But you know, th the constant comparison based on their looks. I mean, young girls today, you know, when, when I was in college in the 80s, it was like real progress that girls and young women, they were not just focused on makeup and appearance and skincare. That was thought to be shallow and women were supposed to have careers and be successful. And, but now it's right back to all they think of, I shouldn't be exaggerating, but a huge amount of their consciousness, even beginning in elementary school, is skincare and hair and makeup. You know, the, the get ready with me videos or, or influencers. Um, so this is a terrible way to raise young women. Of course, uh, girls are more subject to socially oriented perfectionism. They have more relational aggression. Boys have more physical aggression. Um, girls are more subject than boys to emotional contagion because boys are kind of clueless. But among girls, if one girl is anxious, that will make her friends anxious and it will make her friends friends anxious. Emotions spread much more rapidly among networks of girls than among networks of boys. Um, and that's true for mental illnesses as well, including TikTok Tourette's, a kind of a Tourette-like syndrome that girls get from watching TikTok videos of girls modeling Tourette syndrome. And it seems to be true for gender dysphoria. So the wave of, of, the wave of young people thinking that they are trans is overwhelmingly girls, not boys, natal girls, who had no sign of gender dysphoria when they were young, and that was always one of the major signs that it was, that it was real. <clears throat> So in so many ways, when you hook people up, especially girls, they're, one of their great strengths is that they're more sociable and open, they, they feel each other's emotions, and that's a, a beautiful thing normally. But these platforms have weaponized that and exploited this vulnerability. So it's like all the worst parts of junior high school, girls now have to live that seven days a week all the way through young adulthood, it seems. Um, now, the story for boys is different. It took me a long time to see this um, because I was so focused on depression and anxiety, so it looked like it was mostly a girl problem. But after reading Richard we Reeves' wonderful book of boys and men, um, I, I came to see that um, boys have actually been getting pushed out of the real world, and boys and men, pushed out of the real world since the 70s. Of course, they used to own it, they used to run it. The men obviously were dominant. But since the 70s, there's been a lot of progress opening up opportunity for women. At the same time, the economy changed. So jobs that require strength are rare now. And women are rising in service jobs. Men are falling in employment. Um, women are rising in education, college completion, every degree from BA through masters, through law and medicine and PhD. Now it's mostly women. Six, almost 60% of, of BAs go to women now. Um, this is a huge problem for the dating market because women generally don't want to date down, but there are just not a lot of men who've stayed in school and gotten a job. <clears throat> so it took me a while to see, um, but it was the gradual push, you know, getting pushed out of the, of the, the real world. You can't, you, know, you can't play outside, it's too dangerous. Boys need more rough and tumble play, and we banned that because it's too dangerous. You know, only one finger touch. Um, and, then add, so, and then boys go in for the internet more than girls do in the early days. They like computers more than girls do. They play video games more than girls do. So for boys, they really start withdrawing into this virtual world in the, in the 90s and 2000s. Then they get their iPhones and they go much deeper and they get these incredible multiplayer video games. They go much deeper. So for boys, it's not so much anxiety and depression, although that has increased. It's that they have withdrawn from the world in which they could actually learn skills in order to get what they want. Like, how do you flirt with a girl? How do you impress a girl? How do you hold a conversation with a teacher? How do you get a summer? Like, these are things that boys used to learn, and we kind of count on them being able to work and mate and marry when they're adults. But now, the electronic options are so great 
and so easy. You can have all kinds of adventure. You can have fake war, much more graphic than any game of touch football. The online world just brings them in. Their sex lives now, they, they're all on porn, not all. Most are on porn. Uh, I forget what percentage are daily users of porn. Many are addicts. And if you go through, and it's not just like, you know, Playboy, it's like incredibly graphic. Um, really, a lot of it's really very degrading to women. And this is their model of sex. And this is what the girls see too. So boys were basically, we. We put them in a world in which they are just not able to do the things that would turn them into men. And this is, of course, a tragedy for them, for their families, for girls and the women that are going to want to marry them, and for our country. Um, so, um, let's see. All right, so let's talk now about, um, um, let's move on to now Jewish communities and what you can do about this. And I want to talk about some special features that you have because you have two huge advantages in Jewish schools. The first is that you have really strong real world communities. You get together physically, you have rituals, um, you have rules, uh, much more so than in secular schools. Um, and this is very important because I want to show you slide nine. This is really stunning. Um, so uh, on, a, on a major national survey, there are four questions that are like, sometimes I think I'm no good at all. And I feel that my life is not very useful. So you've got four questions like that. <clears throat> and if you look at, um, on a five point scale, how much did young people, th this is high school seniors, I think, how much did high school seniors agree with those statements? And most don't agree with them. Most are not, not depressed and anxious. Um, at least it used to be that way. Um, so they're two on, two on a five point scale. And you can see that conservative, so what I did is I, I, I analyzed the data, breaking it out by liberal or conservative, because for high school seniors they do ask that. Are you on the left, on the right? Um, and then by, um, uh, is, um, is, is religion important in your life? And those who agree with it, four or five, are yes, and those who disagree, one or two, are no. And as you can see, um, the, the, um, the, the, the cons religious conservatives, the red line, um, their mental health is actually getting a little better until the great rewiring, and then it, it does get a little bit worse. It does, it goes up a little bit, but nothing compared to what happens to the secular liberals. If you are a secular liberal, you don't have religion, and being on the left generally is more about freedom, questioning authority, no traditions. Being on the right is much more rigid, bind, binding, constraining. <clears throat> um, I'm a big fan of the sociologist Emile Durkheim who taught us that when people have constraints, they're happier, and when people have no constraints, it's like a gas being released into nothingness you have anomie or normlessness. And so it wasn't, there wasn't much of a difference until the great rewiring, but once childhood moves to the phone-based form, the secular liberals are all on these platforms all the time and they get washed out to sea. Whereas the religious conservatives are rooted in their communities, rooted with their parents, they probably have more siblings, they probably have more contact with their, relative, with their grandparents, um, and they're somewhat anchored so this is a huge advantage that you have uh, in, in uh, Jewish day schools. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, I, and, we'll, and we'll talk about that afterwards, about how to, how to build on that. The other advantage that you have um, is you have extraordinary moral and spiritual resources. In a secular setting, we can't really talk about morals or religion or anything. Um, in the 70s and 80s, the idea was value-free education. Let's take all those traditional values out just focus on you know, math and spelling and things like that. But that leaves a moral vacuum and nature abhors a vacuum and so do politically motivated people. And so into that vacuum comes an ideology, an ideology that has long been popular in education schools about how the world is divided into oppressors and victims and the proper analytical lens for everything is see people as members of a group some groups are good because they're victims, they're oppressed. 
they're virtuous. Some groups are bad because they're up, they're powerful, they have status. So whatever they do is bad, wrong, oppressive. Uh, let's throw out all the progress we made in America of overcoming divisions by race and gender and everything else. Let's bring them all back <clears throat> um, and rank everyone as good or bad based on their group. And then you get this idea of, well, punching down is bad. A person who's high should never criticize or harm a person below. But punching up is virtuous. And if that means killing babies and raping women, well, that's just punching up. The Hamas attack begins to make a lot more moral sense if you have this moral framework you know, merged into your retina. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but I digress. Um, back to schools. Um, your schools are not moral vacuums. You have extraordinary moral resource, and that brings me to slide, uh, slide 10. Because <clears throat> when I was almost done with the book, I felt like, okay, I've covered all this research on these measurable things, but there's something missing. There's something that a phone-based childhood does that I haven't captured. And I realized it's about spirituality. And I'm, I'm a Jewish atheist, like many kids who were raised reform in this country. Um, um, I do belong to a synagogue um, uh, so that my kids can have some, some Jewish education. Um, but, but I came to an extraordinary appreciation of religion from my research on morality. And what I've listed here are seven ways that religious traditions have found to elevate, ennoble, uplift spiritually. Every one of them is blocked by a phone-based childhood. If you're on your phone all day long, you can't do any of these. So you can read them for yourself. I'll just explain one of them. Um, <clears throat> um, so shared sacredness. Um, to create a binding community, you have to come together physically, and then ideally you're gonna do something that involves moving together in time, or singing, or drinking alcohol, or altering consciousness. Groups do things all around the world to bind themselves together in rituals and experiences. And then when they separate, they love each other more, they trust each other more, there's a community. Um, but to do that, you have to have some shared ordering of space and time. When do we come together and where? Um, as, uh, uh, um, let's see, oh, Rabbi, yeah, Rabbi uh, uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote an essay called Shabbat as a Sanctuary in Time. He said, Judaism teaches us to be attached to holiness in time, to be attached to sacred events, to learn how to consecrate sanctuaries that emerge from the magnificent stream of a year. Um, now this essay helps us to understand why a phone-based life is so spiritually deadening. Um, because once your kids go online, once they have full access to the internet, um, then everything is available to everyone all the time with little or no effort. There's no Sabbath, there are no holy days, everything is the same. Your kids are, our kids are growing up in a world of structureless anomie, which means they're much more likely to say, sometimes I think I'm no good at all. I think my life has no meaning. And that's what happened after 2012. <clears throat> um, so I hope that I've convinced you that children need a play-based childhood where mammals, all mammals, need a play-based childhood. And all of us had one, unless we were born after 1995. Um, the phone-based childhood is not compatible with healthy human development. It, it's like trying to grow flowers on Mars. <clears throat> the phone-based life damages far more than mental health. It damages a child's education, maturation, social development, sexual development, civic development, and spiritual development. So what do we do? We are stuck in a collective action problem, as, as, uh, as uh, Julia said about Leonard Sachs put it. As, so a collective action problem is one where we could do something that would make us all better off, but each of us face, faces a cost that is worse than the benefit we'll get from our own action. But if we all did it together, then the cost goes down and the benefit goes way up. None of us want our kids to have Instagram, especially not at age 12. But when they come to you and say, but mom, everyone has Instagram. If I don't have it, I'm left out. 
So this is a trap, a collective action problem. And the way to break collective action problems is with widely shared norms or government regulation, anything that creates a standard where people can sort of fixate and say, yes, let's, let's all do that, that's doable. So I'd like to give you four. <clears throat> so the first um, is no smartphone before high school. It's very simple. You've heard of wait, of wait until eighth? No, that's a bad idea because eighth is in middle school. You don't want to have phones in middle school. Let's get the, everything out of middle school. Let's at least get kids up to high school without all this mental illness and this warped and, and, and stunted growth. So no smartphone till high school. Now you might want to wait longer than that, but I'm just proposing that as a national norm that is achievable. But I have to reach my child. Fine, get him a flip phone. You can call, you can text, and that's it. Flip phones are great. That's why the millennials are okay, because they went through puberty on flip phones. Gen Z is defined in my book by the fact that they went through puberty on smartphones. And I just learned in, in, uh, in talking with Caroline that the, the ultra-Orthodox have what they call kosher phones, which I think basically means no internet, right? Just no, you know, or no, you know, no app store or something. So look into kosher phones. Um, second rule, no social media before 16. The current legal age is 13, completely not enforced. The government set this, the Congress set this in 1998 with no enforcement. The companies are motivated to not know because they're only responsible if they have evidence that a child is under 13, so they just don't want to know. This has to change. Um, but Congress is probably not going to succeed in raising the age. They might pass COSA, a bill that would improve online life a little bit, but raising the age is a big deal, and our Congress is not capable of doing big things anymore, and it'll get caught up in the courts, so don't hope for any uh, help from, from the U.S. Congress. But we can do this ourselves. Um, just don't let your kid have Instagram or TikTok or any of those until they're 16. At least don't let them open an account, and some will get around it. But imagine if your daughter comes to you and says, Mom, 25% of the kids in my grade have TikTok and Instagram. Now it's very easy to say no. <clears throat> um, third rule, uh, phone-free schools. And that's one that we'll focus on. And that's one where if you are allowing kids to bring phones into a school, I mean, you can bring them into the school, fine, they're useful for getting to and from, but you, they have to be put in phone lockers is the best. Yonder pouches are okay, but they, you go on YouTube, you find five different ways to get your phone out, um, my daughter told me. Um, uh, they're still much better than just backpack or pocket. They, they, they're good, but they're defeatable, whereas phone lockers would be the best way. Um, as long as kids have access to texts uh, and the internet, they're going to do it, and they're not going to pay attention in class. So it's vital uh, that all, phone, all schools, K-12, go phone-free all the way through high school. Um, I've begun to have screen-free classes, um, in, even for MBA students, and they love it. It's a little hard at first, but then they realize, oh wait, oh, this is what it's like to pay attention to the teacher. Um, and then the final rule here is far more free play and independence. And this one actually needs a little, elabor a a little bit of elaboration. Um, and so because we're talking, they're represented at the schools here. Um, so I have a slide there at the bottom, how to create a playful school. Um, and so here I want to especially thank Lenore Skenazy sitting right over there. Uh, she wrote a book called Free Range Kids that really changed the way that my wife and I parent. And then Lenore and I created an organization called Let Grow. If you go to letgrow.org or just come talk to Lenore afterwards. Lenore, you're going to be right up here perhaps? Okay, right there. <clears throat> uh, and Lenore actually, Lenore actually helped me write these chapters, the, the last chapters in the book with advice. Um, and so here's four simple rules for creating a, play, a playful school. Um, longer recess, I don't know how long the recess is where you are, but all across America it's down to 25 minutes or so on average for elementary school kids. They get very little recess. Maximum security prisoners are guaranteed far more outside time than our elementary school children. Longer recess <clears throat> with less adult intervention. Um, a second easy way to, to get them, what you want is them to play unsupervised. It's very important that they be unsupervised. Because if there's an adult present, the kid's learning to call in the adult to punish the other kid. Whereas if there's no adult present, they have to work it out. And that's the essential skill. 
So, um, yeah, so just open the playground for 30 minutes before school starts. The kids, they, they love just time on the playground. Um, offer a let grow play club, which is you do the same thing one or two or five days a week. Parents are so afraid, they won't, they're, they're, I, I'm, I'm sure many of you are afraid to like let your nine year old just like go to Central Park and play on a ball field, right? Raise your hand if you'd be a little afraid to let your nine or 10 year old do that. Okay, like most of you probably, okay. But would you let your kid stay after school and play on the playground? Of course you would. So that's a real easy way to get started, letting, trusting your kid to, to survive without an adult chaperone. Um, and lastly, do the Lecro experience, which is basically a homework assignment where you just tell kids, come up with something that you haven't done by yourself before that you'd like to try, like walk the dog or make lunch for yourself or make dinner for the family. And it's transformative. Uh, Lenore's been doing this for a while at Let Grow. We, I mean, the, the results are incredible. The kids become competent, they overcome anxiety, they become less anxious. Um, so there's, these are very simple things. And you know how expensive they are? Free, they're all free. None of these things I'm proposing cost anything, except yonder pouches a little bit. Um, so, um, so to conclude, we're stuck in this terrible collective action problem, which is destroying the mental health and maturation of boys and girls. Um, and the way to get out of a collective action problem is to act collectively, to do coordination. And we can do that right here, right now. So a couple of questions. Um, how many of you are professors or administrators at a university? Raise your hand if you're listed at a university as being on faculty in any way, shape, or form. Okay, about, about seven of you. I invite you all to join Heterodox Academy. It's an organization I founded with some other social scientists originally to encourage viewpoint diversity at universities. Why is it mostly the Ivy League schools where Jews are being intimidated, attacked, and threatened? Because those are the most ideologically pure schools those are the ones that have the biggest problems. The, the, the more elite the school, the more prestigious it is, the more it's gonna be uniformly on the left. You need viewpoint diversity. And guess who understood this? Jews. I mean, we're like the preeminent group that realized the way to truth is not listening to a teacher, it's working things out in argument and discussion with a, with a partner, with a Torah study partner. Um, so, uh, so Faculty, please join Heterodox Academy. It's free and you'll, you'll help improve universities. Um, how many parents do we have in here who have children under 16? Raise your hand high. Okay, most of you. Um, so I urge you all to, when you get home tonight, just go to letgrow.org, sign up for the mailing list. Um, uh, and it, there's so many ideas for what you can do uh, with your kids. Um, and then commit to enacting the reforms I mentioned. No smartphone until high school, no social media until 16. So we can all coordinate, uh, the parents can coordinate, but it's much easier if you do that through schools. And that's the big thing we can do tonight. Schools can set the norms, the principal can set the norm. The principal can of course decide, or the head of school, you know, what's our rule in here? But if the head of school and the teachers send a message out saying, please, parents, please, don't even give your kids a social media account until 16. We, we're, we're at, we can't make you, but we're asking this of you. If the parents get a clear signal, now they can say to their kid, but you know, the principal asked us not to do this, rather than just like, uh, what do I do? Um, so schools are incredibly powerful in setting norms, and any school that decides to solve this problem can do so, and it can do it in a way that helps the parents escape from the collective action problem at home. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Okay, so I'm very excited now to talk about, what, about schools and what schools can do, um, because the schools especially, religious schools, Jewish schools, Jewish day schools, you can make changes, you can do this much better than the secular schools. And if you get this right, your students will thrive in a toxic digital age, and you will be a beacon unto the world. So let's do this and let's do it together. Thank you. Before we delve more deeply into some of these topics, I'd love for you to first clarify, what counts as social media? There's obviously Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, mm -hmm. but there are also WhatsApp groups and group chats and YouTube channels and all sorts of iPad games and video games yeah. that have social components That's embedded right. within them. So what counts as social media and is there a spectrum of most to least problematic? 
Yes. No, thank you. That, no, that's, that, that's an important question <coughs> um, because many of these things are social and social can be good. It's usually good. Texting is okay. Um, it's, uh, these things used to be called social networking systems and you'd use Facebook to find other people's pages and you'd connect. That was not harmful. But once they introduced the news feed, the like button, and algorithms to decide what's going to come in your feed, now you have a corporation taking control of your input stream. You do not want a corporation to control your child's input stream. So WhatsApp is like texting. You know, it's not an algorithm thing. It's you're literally talking with your friends. So I'm not talking about WhatsApp. I'm talking about anything in which the key activity is making content or commenting on content, and you have a stream of it so that unless you have a lot of willpower, it will fill up every moment of your life. And so that's Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, all of these classic, um, classic social media platforms. Now, my kids, both, uh, my kids both are on the track team at Brooklyn Tech, and they're all on, um, is it Strava or wait? Yeah, I think it's called Strava. There's, a, there's an app that all the runners are on. And technically it is social media because they post their run times and other kids comment. Now there's no algorithms, so that's good. Um, and it's great that they have this community of runners. Now, here's the thing. What the kids desperately need is time in the real world together. And our devices and technology can help that. And Strava helps them do that. But Instagram, TikTok, these things, they're so addictive. If your kid is on it, they will spend less time with their friends. That's a helpful clarification. We're a group of families and institutions that care deeply not only about the well-being of our children, but about the perpetuation of Jewish communal life. And I'd like to begin our discussion by exploring three pillars of Jewish mm -hmm. communal life. And seeing how social media interacts with and possibly threatens these pillars. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start with healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. Healthy relationships are yeah. foundational to a healthy community. In your book, you write a great deal about the ways social media interferes with friendship for girls and yep. um, setting norms around romantic relationships for boys. So let's start with girls. When it comes to friendship, mm -hmm. what's, what does social media promise and what does it actually right. deliver? So girls really need a couple of friends. Even one is, is very protective to have a best friend. Um, to have several friends and a group of friends is even better. They don't need 500 friends. They don't need 50 friends. And if once you, what, what social media promises is lots of friends, keeping up with your friends, more people friend you before you know it, you've got hundreds or thousands of friends. It's all very shallow. And it's kind of like printing Deutschmarks or something. It's like they become worthless. So what we find is that the more time girls spend on social media, the lonelier they are. Now, video games do that for boys. There it's a little different because the video games are great fun. Most girls say that social media is bad and they would pay if, to get rid of it. To, if nobody was on it, they would like that. They would be freed of it. Boys don't say that about video games. Boys love video games and they're not as bad. But what happens is, um, uh, you know, many of us remember playing video games, sitting next to a friend who came over to play video games with us. That doesn't happen anymore because everyone has their headset, their big screen, whatever. Um, so with boys, um, it's that as they ensconce themselves in screens, they just lose the ability to actually socialize. And while they feel, and then their lone boys are much lonelier than they were in 2010. Um, while they feel that they, they, when they're lonely, they're attracted to the sociality of the video game. It's better than nothing, but it actually is like, you know, eating styrofoam. It's not going to fill you up because then when they're, now they have, they don't see friends in the real world. So when they're not on the game, now they're really lonely. I'd like to turn now to a second pillar and that's attention or our ability to learn. Our ability as a community um, to pass down our inheritance mm. to the next generation rests on young people's ability to pay attention. Yeah. And that yeah. might look like sitting through long services in shul or mm -hmm. studying ancient texts or participating in extended rituals like the Passover Seder. Yeah. In our tradition, um, attentiveness unlocks the beauty of many yeah. of our rituals. 
Could you talk to us about today's attention economy, <laughs> how it's shaped by social media mm -hmm. and the neurological impact yeah, it's having sure. on children? Yeah, so um, the most important ability here is called executive function. Um, the frontal cortex handles our ability to focus, to decide what we're gonna attend to, to decide when to switch, um, to do anything you need executive function. And if you don't have good executive function, you're scattered, you can't finish things, you're easily distractible. Um, so it looks like when you grow up with these constant switching of screens, it looks like there are neurological changes. I, I do, it looks as though your brain actually is changed and, and um, you will find it harder to focus for the rest of your life. But a big part of the effect isn't necessarily directly neurological, it's behavioral. If kids, by the time they're 13, have never had to be bored, because if, if there's an elevator ride, if there's a line at a cafeteria, anything, they can pull out something. So they don't have the ability to tolerate any boredom. Um, and so, so functionally, practically, they really can't focus if they have access to devices. <clears throat> More to the point, if you think about culture as transmission <clears throat> from one generation to the next with modification, like, like Darwinian evolution, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> if you think about culture as being passed down from one generation to another, and then you take the receiving generation and let's say normally it would be, you know, five gigabytes of information is what Jewish knowledge would be. Let's call it five gigabytes. Uh, and there's a certain flow speed that it can come in. But on the receiving end, you now have a thousand gigabytes coming in every day of other stuff. Just no room. There's no room for transmission. And that, I believe, is what's happening in the broader society. Um, uh, I heard a phrase from Ronald Reagan. Um, he said something like, we're never... What, freedom is only one, like the loss of freedom is one generation away. I can't remember the quote, anyone remember it? The point is that if you don't pass on the va American values in a single generation, it can be gone. And I'm afraid that's, what's, that's what will happen if we don't keep our kids off for a long time and keep them in communities that are transmitting role models, um, mentorship, and learning. So that's a great segue to my third pillar which I identified as moral formation, really passing down values. We're a part of a community of Jewish day schools, and they're different from other educational institutions. The mission isn't just education, but it's the moral formation of students, the future leaders of the Jewish people. And this becomes very clear when you read the mission statements of these schools. And yes, I did read all 50. And you see that there's a shared vocabulary, words like menschlichkeit, mm -hmm. midot, you know, the good character traits, um, derech eretz, acting in a decorous or dignified way. Mm -hmm. um, so if young people are what they consume, what are they? Mm -hmm. How is social media shaping their character? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, kids are not just sponges who will soak up whatever you transmit to them what they're most concerned about is fitting in with their peers. Um, they're not trying to impress their parents. They're really trying to impress their peers. And so if the adults are saying, don't do drugs, study the Torah, you know, if, if the adults are saying that, that's not gonna have any effect. If the kids are saying, no, you know, come out with us and, you know, smoke pot and, and you know, um, we'll sit in the park and we'll look at our iPhones. Um, kids are much more receptive to what's going on around them. Now, they're trying to soak up a culture, but they're especially concerned about the youth culture. And so this is why I think ultra-Orthodox people, very religious Christian communities, they really try to separate their kids from the broader society. And I think they're probably right to do so. So you mentioned influencers and role models. When you and I were growing up, we looked mm -hmm. up to role models, and today, mm -hmm. young people follow influencers. What makes someone a successful influencer, and yeah. what's at stake when parents outsource the mentorship yeah. algorithm to Instagram. Yeah. So humans have built into them some learning shortcuts or learning um, programs. One is conformity, just, you know, just do what everyone else is doing. And if everyone's wearing something, you think you should wear that thing too. Um, the other is called prestige bias. Don't just copy the average, figure out who does everybody look up to, who's cool, and then copy that person. So that's especially strong in teenagers. And 
teenagers have always had idols, you know, athletes, musicians, things like that. And athletes and musicians had at least become excellent in order to rise to the top. But what the prestige economy has done, social media, and they're explicit about this. There are quotes from, uh, what's his name? One of the, the first president of, uh, of Facebook. Um, uh, there are quotes from them saying, you know, they knew what they were doing to hack the, the prestige desires so that you're prestigious just because you have a lot of followers. You don't have to actually do anything. And so the, the link between working hard to achieve something which will get you prestige has been severed. Whatever you do to get the followers, that's it. And that tends to be being more outrageous, not being more thoughtful um, and, and creative and productive. Well, now that you have us feeling pretty depressed and full of despair, Let's turn to practical solutions, specifically how parents and school leaders can redirect currents in their own communities. And I want to start with schools. So there's a school of thought that states social media may be bad, but it's here to stay. And we need to give our kids the tools mm -hmm. to filter out the bad, to enjoy the benefits, and to use social media responsibly. Mm -hmm. And what if we don't teach them how to use it responsibly? That's mm -hmm. even worse. And so many schools have subscribed to this view and they've implemented um, social media literacy programs or curriculums around using social media responsibly. Mm -hmm. Can young people use social media responsibly? Do you think mm -hmm. there's a merit to this type of program? Um, so what you're describing is not, this is what's amazing about this. Nobody likes this, nobody wants it. Everyone is resigned. I hear this over and over again. Oh, you know, the gene is out of the bottle. You know, that ship has sailed. Um, you know, when the Titanic sank, you know, it had a sister ship. And, you know, they probably said, wait, maybe we should stop using this ship until we figure out why it sank. Um, we sent our kids out on a ship and it has sunk. And people are saying, well, what are you going to do? You know, all kids are going to sink. Sorry, this isn't a very good metaphor, sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, my point is that we are in a collective action problem and people don't realize that so they're resigned to it and what i'm saying is let's change that you know when i was a kid you could get cigarettes in a vending machine and so a lot of kids smoked and eventually we decided you know what even though it's going to inconvenience adults a little bit no more vending machines and now very few kids smoke now social media is much more addictive than cigarettes because cigarettes is just biologically addictive and it was never the case that most kids smoked Social media is socially addictive, and so you quickly get to the point where everyone has to be on it. Um, um, but um, so social media education, it's probably worth doing in high school. I've seen some studies that it does improve things a little bit. But, you know, I think it's more like drug education. You know, should we just say, you know, look, fifth graders, they're going to do, do crack. Like, it's just out there. So let's teach them how to do it well. You know, and they're going to do drugs when, as adults, so, you know, we don't want them to, like, learn irresponsible. Let's, let's, you know, when they're here with us, let's teach them how to do drugs properly. Um, there is no, I mean, the idea that we need to start kids early is insane. It doesn't take, how long does it take to learn how to use Instagram? A couple days. So let's keep them off to their 16, and they're not going to be at any disadvantage compared, compared to a kid who's been on Instagram since 10. I would never hire that kid. If somebody says, I didn't get social media until I was 16, I say, oh, your brain might actually work. So the question submitted by most parents in advance of this evening was actually not about social media. It was about screens in schools. Mm -hmm. And many parents preface this question by yeah. saying, I consider myself pro-tech. I'm into mm -hmm. coding. I'm into STEM. I'm not mm -hmm. regressive in that way. However, I have an yeah. intuition that the student screen interactions throughout the day, mm -hmm. iPads for the younger grades and the Chromebooks for the yeah. older grades, has some real trade-offs. Do you have any research that could point yes. to the impact of screens on learning and development? Yes. So the error that we're all making is that when this stuff began to come out in the 90s, when laptops you know, and the internet, the kids who went for them, they seemed to be getting some skills. And then those kids went on to create companies and invent products. And we had this idea, it was sensible at the time, that there's a digital divide. And if wealthy kids get get their own computer when they're 12, but poor kids don't. So we have to get a computer for every kid. We have to close the digital divide. And so everybody has screens, everybody has computers, everybody has something. 
Um, well, it's not like that anymore. Now everything is so easy to use that when you give a kid a screen, they're not gonna learn how to program. It's all entertainment. That nine hours a day, it's essentially all entertainment. It's video games, YouTube, streaming. This has no benefit. Now in school, you might say, oh, well, you know, in school. No, there too, there's no clear benefit. Um, the UN, UNESCO just put out a report earlier this year reviewing a lot of literature saying basically there's no evidence that all this stuff is actually helping anyone and there's a lot of evidence that it's distracting them. Kids are getting dumber um, according to uh, national surveys. It didn't start with COVID. Academic progress is going down since COVID. It started after 2012 because they're distracted all the time. And so I think we should do what they do in Silicon Valley. The people who made this technology, they send their kids to the Waldorf School, which has zero technology, zero screens. That's what we should do. Get rid of all of it. Now, I'm overstating it a little bit. It's fine if the teacher has all kinds of stuff and a screen and they can use the internet and nothing, but it's the personal devices. So yeah, you can have, comp you can have desktop computers in the school that they can use, and, and high school might be different, but at least elementary and middle school, do not give anyone a personal device. Interesting, noted. I want to transition now to parents and then we'll come back to the collective action problem. So you mentioned what, your, what you think the social media policies should be. Mm -hmm. um, many parents asked in advance, what type of explanation could you provide to kids to accompany this type of policy mm -hmm. that would resonate with them? Um, <clears throat> so one thing that, that I'm really happy about Gen Z is that they're not in denial at all. They're not defensive. In fact, I've been looking for an essay, you know, with all the talk about banning social media, you'd think that some kid somewhere would have at some point written an essay saying, no, don't ban social media. We love it, we need it, it's good. I haven't found it yet. Nobody's saying that. So they're all resigned. Um, and so they're all afraid of being taken off if everyone else is on. And, I, actually, I should really be clear about this. You know, I'm saying take away the technology, take away the technology. If that's all you do and you're still overprotecting your kid, what are they gonna do? Sit and watch the paint in your living room? Like, they have nothing to do. So y you, have to, you, have to, you have to make this a, an exchange where, you know, yeah, you're, you're not gonna have unlimited access to screens. You know, you can watch some TV, we can watch as a family, whatever. But you're not gonna have a personal device to use whenever you want. Now, um, you know, let's find ways that you spend a lot of time with other kids. So I'm really pro sleepover, pro multiple person play date, let it be chaotic, let them get into fights. That's exciting, that's fun. So you can't just take away the screens. We took away all of their independence, all their unsupervised time, and we gave them screens. We have to undo both of those, not just one. And that, if, if that would be appealing to a lot of kids. So I want to revisit collective action. And you mentioned the Wait Till Eighth Pledge, and that's mm -hmm. a, collect a collective action tool that many of us are familiar with. It works as follows. A group of parents band together and commit to not giving their children smartphones until eighth grade. And of course, that's a goalpost, and they, the idea is you push it back. Um, I've seen this pledge take off when groups of parents, mm -hmm. in like a grassroots way, commit to doing this together. I haven't really seen schools get involved in this pledge. Right. Do you think there's an opportunity for a school to encourage this, require mm -hmm. this? Yes. I know you don't like wait till eighth, but for this community, yeah. I like smartphone yeah. rock petit What does so that mean? Smartphone only in high school. Okay, yeah, Keeper. that's it, that's it. Um, that's what I said. What do you think is the yeah. role of the school with this type yeah. of pledge? So this is really sad that schools aren't, don't have the confidence to to, to make these rules or to suggest this to the parents because they're all afraid. I've, I've spoken at many schools. I can tell you that all the teachers hate the phones. Every teacher hates the phones. They have enough work to do. They had enough work to do in 2010. Now they have to be phone police. So all the teachers hate the phones. Most of the principals, at Brooklyn Tech, the principal says that he, he, uh, he likes them, but he's the only one I've heard of, unfortunately, or whatever. Um, um, but most of the principals hate it too, because it's constant drama that they can't even, you know, bully them. There's all kinds of problems that happen with the phones. Oh my God, the TikTok challenges, the violence, the destruction. So they all hate it. Why don't they, why don't they ban the phones? Why don't they tell parents, 
please don't give your kid a TikTok account. Why don't they say that? Um, because they're afraid of the few parents who will be very angry at them. So it's another collective action problem. Most parents want help. Most parents would welcome the principal saying, phone free in school, and please, I strongly suggest that you limit social media at home. Now, none of them say that because they're afraid of pushback. But if you contact them, you know, they're, they're politicians in a way. If they hear from the large majority of parents who actually want help setting norms, then they'll do it because they want to. They hate the phones too. So for the final part of our conversation, I want to turn to Israel. It's clear that we're, that we're living in a moment of great trial for the Jewish people. Yeah. We're at war with enemies who seek our annihilation. Yeah. We're seeing rampant anti-Semitism. Um, what's going on on campuses is very upsetting. Yeah. Um, but especially terrifying, like you mentioned, is that we're seeing a huge portion of Gen Z supports Hamas. Mm -hmm. Could you help us understand why this is the case specifically with TikTok? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we're used to understanding influence from media, like television. You watch a show, it's 25 minutes long, maybe you watch another show, and then we move to YouTube. And maybe it's 10 minutes, four minutes, 15 minutes, and then you watch another one. Um, uh, television is, you're passive. It, it, television can't train you the way a dog trainer trains a dog. We got a puppy last year and you watch the trainer work, like they keep giving little tiny treats and before you know it, the dog will sit, roll over. They, you, know, you can train a dog to do amazing things in an hour if you can give them lots of little rewards. That's why TikTok is so different from television. TikTok, they're what, 15 seconds long on average, something like that. It's, you know, it's, it's this repetitive motion and you get a reward or less of a reward, you get a reward. Uh, and commenting, you, you know, you, or you post something, you get rewards, rewards. So, so social media and short form content is the most dangerous because it's like a dog trainer training a dog. And we know that China literally requires its companies, this is in the law, they must obey the Communist Party, they must do, they must help advance the communist or whatever, I forget how it's worded. And so TikTok is a Chinese company, and we know, uh, I, I, I urge you to listen to um, the Center for Humane Technology, Tristan Harris has an amazing podcast, but they had an episode on this. The day of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, TikTok in Russia and all over changed, especially in Russia, it, TikTok changed to show overwhelmingly pro-Russia content and to ban, to block, and suppress others. Because TikTok will do what the Chinese government tells it to do. And this is the company that governs our children's attention. This is the company that is training our children like dogs. So they can, they have a lot of influence. Now, I don't know whether it's China or whether it's, you know, Hamas and, and other terrorist organizations are doing it. Um, certainly China is at, at, in, a, in a Cold War II with us, and so of course they're gonna help anyone who's, who's trying to undermine us. Um, so it's completely insane that this, that this thing is even legal in this country, given the control by the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, imagine, as Tristan says, you know, imagine if the 1950s, the Soviets owned ABC, NBC, CBS, and PBS, and the New York Times. Like, how would we have let that happen? But we did. But it strikes me that there's a tension here because on the one hand, you've convinced us it's harmful, but mm -hmm. on the other hand, it's a battlefield in this war mm -hmm. and there is an information war mm -hmm. and many yeah. parents and young people feel a very noble impulse yeah. to create pro-Israel content right. and to put it on social media to counter the, pro -Hama the Hamas yeah. propaganda. So yeah. how would you counsel parents yeah. and young people around navigating yeah. that tension? So there, there's an enormous difference between an adult and a child, both psychologically and legally. Um, I have a lot of libertarian friends, I have a lot of libertarian leanings, um, and so I'm very reluctant to say to 18 or 20 year olds, you can't go on Instagram and post pro-Israel or pro-Hamas content. So if we're talking about adults on Instagram, which is not owned by the Chinese Communist Party, I have very little to say about that. And as for whether you should be posting, I suppose it is a war and I, I, we don't want it all to be dominated by Hamas, so yeah, I suppose that is useful. Uh, but you know, we have rules about it, what age kids can become soldiers. 
And the idea that middle school kids, middle school kids now have to be all about politics, this is insane. This is really, really bad for them. And this helps explain why the least happy people in the country are young liberal girls. The majority of them, in one survey, the majority said they have a mental disorder. Because young liberal girls use social media the most, and especially political stuff. Young conservative girls are not all about, you know, politics. So keep the, yeah, so, you know, should high school kids be posting? I don't think so. But it's a collective action problem. Let's just raise the age. Let's make it not possible for them to open an account. So this, a closing question. The human story is an incredible one, but mm -hmm. at present it does feel like we're in a dark chapter. Yeah. Net net, do you feel more optimistic or pessimistic about our generation's ability to yeah. forge a path that allows oh, our boy. kids to flourish in an age of tech? Oh, I thought you wanted to end on a happy note. Let's see. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the big picture, I believe, is that we are at the end of the Gutenberg era. There was an era of history, began with the printing press, a lot of chaos, empires fell, nation states were formed based on language. I mean, the printing press transformed everything. And eventually, it was amazing. Like, we're all glad the printing press happened. Um, but it took hundreds of years for society to work out how do you have institutions in a text-based age. And I believe that that ended in 2014. Um, I've used the metaphor of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel fell in 2014. And in that story, you know, humans' incredible hubris, God says, let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand one another. And I think that's what happened in 2014. We, now, we will never again have shared reality. We will never again have the ability to sort of have a general consensus in the country of what's going on. Um, so it's going to be really tough, and this could go on for many decades. It could go on for a century or two. That's pretty depressing. Um, um, in the long run, the human story is amazing. In the long run, things keep getting better and better. Um, we happen to be born at a time, you know, our parents or grandparents were born at a time of incredible ascendance for America, for Jews, uh, for Israel. Um, but, you know, history is cyclical. Most societies or East Asian societies know this. Western societies often think it's linear. So, yeah, we're on a down period. This could go on a very, very long time. But on the plus side, we, what we do really, really matters. And we have to understand what's happening, make wise choices, and do the work. Um, so that at least is a silver lining, that all of our kids who think that their lives don't matter, actually we're living at the most pivotal time in possibly 500 years. Thank you. I think now we can take a couple questions from the audience. We're almost at time. Joanna. I'm convinced, and I'm, I'm not going to do the experiment on my kids and give them social media, but are there any children who grow up in this phone age, digital age, who are somehow fine? And mm -hmm. if so, yeah. what's protecting them? Yes. Yeah. So most kids are not mentally ill. As I said, most, most young liberal girls are, but most Gen Z is not mentally ill. Um, and again, I, by mentally, I just mean like they say that they've been told that they have a diagnosis. They might be exaggerating. Um, most kids are going to turn out fine in terms of mental health. It's a tragedy that a third won't. That's horrible compared to all of history. Um, what's protective is sports and religion, um, team sports especially, individual sports not as much, um, gymnastics, you know, track, my kids are, it's, you know, it's, it's great, but if they were on a basketball team, a football team, a field hockey team, you're truly interdependent, that's the most protective thing you can give your kids. Sport, team sports, a religious community, certainly a stable home environment, avoid chaos in the home. Um, those are, those are the most protective elements I know. And, ki and kids who just have a lot of play, a lot of free play with other kids, give them a lot of that. Nava. Thank you. Um, there are certainly lots of ways that social media is very harmful for children and you advocate waiting until 16, but I'm wondering if you would agree that there are also ways that you could use social media for very positive things. And Like what? Um, well, I'm thinking about a 10th grader I met this past weekend who uses her Instagram account to post 
paraphrase accounts of great rabbis' works, and okay. she does this on a weekly basis, and she has followers who read it, and she adds her own thoughts. Mm -hmm. It's hard to argue that using it in that way is going to be very harmful for her, and I'm wondering if there could maybe be outlines of using it in ways that are positive, and mm -hmm. if there's a way to monitor that. Yeah, so, you know, like Instagram is mostly positive stuff. You know, Twitter is a hellhole, but Instagram is mostly nice stuff. Now, it turns out that's actually really bad for girls because it's, you know, girls talking about their lives and, their, and everything's beautiful, and so, you know, even positive stuff can end up being bad. The case you give is clearly a good one, but don't confuse social media with the internet. People say, oh, thank God for social media during COVID. Otherwise, how would kids have communicated? Yeah, imagine if all they had was Zoom and FaceTime and email and texting and WhatsApp and um, if, if they could only get information from Google and Bing and Wikipedia, and if they could only put up a blog and read each other's blogs. I mean, we're drowning in information, we're drowning in connections, even if you get rid of all social media. So she could still put up a blog. Laura. So we, we've spoken a little bit about how, you know, we can stand up, schools can kind of stand up and take a stance, and also how there's a developmentally appropriate age at which you're exposed to certain things, and I yeah. think we can all agree on that. For the parents in the room, um, is there any, you know, we're very, a lot of parents are tethered to their phones yeah. because they're not, you know, That's doing, right. they're, they're working, they're yeah. connecting, they're supervising, you know, whatever it is that we have to do. Is there anything that you recommend mm -hmm. that we're, we're role modeling improperly yeah. and need to sacrifice in order to help definitely, them? Definitely, definitely. So right, the first thing is, you know, put your, yeah, put your own house, yeah. So you, right, put your own house in order. Um, now, so first, do a checkup on yourself. And what I say to my students is, the original iPhone was an incredible Swiss Army knife. It was a camera, music player, flashlight, maps. It was an amazing Swiss Army knife. I loved it. If that was what the iPhone was, it's amazing. One of the best inventions ever. But as it transformed from social networking systems to social media platforms, you get the App Store, which Steve Jobs did not want, but you get the App Store, before you know it, in the age of virality, now the smartphone for my students is not a Swiss Army knife, it's a puppet master. They are slaves to it. As soon as their eyes open, they're on it, and then when they go to bed, they're off. And in between, they're on it. It's a puppet master, it controls them. That is incredibly unhealthy. And that's happening to a lot of adults as well. So ask yourself, is your phone a Swiss Army knife that you use, or is it in any way your master? And if it's your master, then you're modeling that for your kids, and I guarantee you, it's taking up way more of your attention than you would choose to do, which means that your kids get way less of your attention. And I'll give you a, a phrase that people seem to respond to well, which is continuous partial attention. If you're trying to interact with your kid and feed them and you're cooking and you're responding to texts, so you're scattered, you're fragmented, and you're sort of, you know, the kids are developing an internal working model of a relationship. And if their model is, People don't look at you in the eye. That's just not what people do. People look at screens when they talk to you. That's, that's what you're showing them. So we all have to get our own phone use um, in order. Um, and then, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're going to work, like work. And leave your kid alone. Your kid doesn't need you as much as you think, especially if there's other kids to play with. Um, um, but if you're with your kid, try to spend more time that's just like really connecting and make eye contact. We're almost out of time. I'm wondering if you have any closing words of inspiration or encouragement for the Jewish community here. Um, yes. Um, so first, I just somebody just sent me the video of, of the Maccabees saying, we're still here. I thought that was a really powerful and inspiring uh, video. Um, and so, yeah, we're still here. Um, another thing is that in some ways, um, you know, J Jews, you know, not exactly invented modernity, but we, we were pre-adapted to thrive in a modern, free, liberal democracy where hard work and talent and um, inventiveness and creativity were rewarded. Um, and we have certain intellectual and moral resources about community and about viewpoint diversity. 
that prepare us to thrive and our kids to thrive in this really complicated world. And so things are gonna get a lot more confusing every year as AI comes in. Um, uh, I think Jews as a community have, again, the intellectual resources to stay anchored on ancient wisdom, community obligations, virtues, and a stable, long-lasting community. So it's gonna be tough for everyone um, but I think Jews have certain resources that will really be conducive to, to success.